Hello and welcome to Unhacked. I'm Brian Graff, SVP of Compliance Advisory here at, at Abacode. Uh, today we're going to continue our deep dive into CMMC. For those of you who haven't seen the previous videos, we are taking you through the CMMC standard and implementation process, and today we'll begin reviewing the control sections. Uh, to review, a control is uh, methods, policies, and procedures, uh, either manual or automated, by which an organization uh, will safeguard or protect assets. So it's a description of the, uh, the process that you implement to either restrict access, uh, secure, you know, enforce secure changes, um, backup systems, uh, whatever you're doing is that description of that process. It could be manual, could be automated through the use of technology or just a personnel process control. CMMC has uh, 17 control groups or families, and today we're gonna start reviewing them starting with access control. So access control is the provisioning, configuring, modification, and decommissioning of access to systems and data. And that can be personnel or other systems. There are several components uh, that must be considered when implementing access control, but the key is least privilege. Least privilege basically means that you're only providing users, whether they're employees, customers, or whoever, the absolute minimum access and functionality they require to do their job or carry out their function. So organizations must at all times, um, and this is it should be a standard whether you're going through CMMC or, or you're any sort of organization, uh, you must at all times adhere to least privilege. Uh, access controls must be set up to enforce least privilege. So what does that mean? That means that uh, personnel are not given admin access unless they absolutely require. They are not given access to systems unless they absolutely need access to it. Um, does, do your personnel need email on, your, on their phones? If they do, then grant them access to it. But a lot of employees don't need email on their phones. They don't need access to sensitive systems. Don't provide access unless it's absolutely required for that employee to do their job. If you turn off that, that access, they can no longer perform that function. Then yes, that is a required least privilege function. So when uh, enforcing access control, you have to require uh, authorization, meaning uh, there must be a process by which an access request is documented. Uh, specifics of that request are put into a ticket or a form. Um, which would include uh, the personnel or the system that needs access, the specific systems they need access to, um, the, the approver, whoever is um, usually the owner of that system or a supervisor has provided uh, their approval to grant that person access to the system, and any other technical um, specifications that are required for an administrator to provision that access. Um, perhaps there are already um, user profiles of that uh, new resource will be assigned to, or there's a custom uh, access profile that needs to be set up specifically for that user that should all be in that access request ticket with the approval. Same with modifications. So you should treat a modification just like uh, a new access request. Uh, it has to be approved um, and it has to be documented just like a new access request. In addition to that, uh, personnel should be reviewing uh, existing access with new access to make sure that least privilege is maintained. If you're transferring someone from one position to a new position, they probably don't need all of their old access to, uh, to their old systems. Uh, you want to make sure that you're removing any access they no longer need. And then deprovisioning. When, when uh, users are terminated, you want to make sure there's a process for that, that that's documented. Uh, users are terminated uh, uh, the day of uh, their termination when they no, no longer need access or before that you're not leaving accounts open after a user has been terminated, employee has been terminated, and that you are uh, configuring that system so that if uh, an IT administrator or someone else needs uh, the data from that profile, they can access it, but that user can no longer use that profile and no one else can log into that profile as well. Restricting access to admin functions, we talked that, about that a little bit already. Uh, you wanna make sure that it, Administrator access is restricted to only those personnel that absolutely require it, be a, uh, personnel that are granting access to other users or, um, or performing uh, admin roles. Other than that, uh, no one should have admin uh, functions in your systems. Restricting ingress and egress. So you're not just restricting access to systems, but how, how someone can uh, access a system. So, and that depends on your organization and the services you provide. 
So do your employees work remotely? Uh, do they have to be on site? Uh, can they access your systems via VPN tunnel? Is there a uh, public web application that they use to, to access and perform their job duties? You have to make sure that those uh, ingress and egress points are, are documented, that personnel that uh, have access, especially remote access, um, that that's been approved and that those access methods are, are secured. So if you have external access, are you uh, applying multi-factor authentication? Are you using a secure gateway with encrypted um, uh, with a encrypted VPN? You wanna make sure that it's not just remote access, that that access is secure, um, not just the, um, uh, the setup of the account itself, but the method by which they, they access your system. So the next control family is asset management. Um, this family is critical in enforcing effective access control because if you don't have a handle on all the systems connected to your environment, how are you really restricting access control? It's really, really not possible. So you want to make sure that you have a, uh, a, an inventory of all of your systems, be it hardware, software, third-party systems. That must be established and it must be uh, maintained ongoing. So when you're uh, adding or removing assets that, that needs to be included in the asset inventory as well. So asset management is basically just the establishment and ongoing maintenance of asset onboarding, tracking, modification, and decomm decommissioning uh, assets. Uh, it also includes uh, creating processes for handling CUI data. So to satisfy asset management controls is vital that an organization maintain an up-to-date uh, asset inventory like we discussed. So you have to start by uh, identifying all of the CUI in your system. Um, where does it go? How do you get it from your um, federal agency customers or your, let's say your prime vendors or whoever's giving you that CUI? How is it getting into your system? Are customers emailing it to you? Is there a web portal where they're accessing? Maybe they're submitting requests on a portal. Uh, maybe they submit a request via like a Dropbox or a secure share site. Um, how, how is that data getting in? And then how does that data get into your system? Where does it ultimately reside? What's being done to it? And how does it get back out to the, to the customer? Do they go to a portal and get reports? Are you emailing, um, are you emailing deliverables to customers? That determines your, uh, your environment, your boundary, and the assets that are all included inside that boundary. So once you have that boundary, now you can document all the assets inside it. You also want to make sure you're documenting uh, an asset owner. All of your assets require an owner, someone ultimately responsible for that asset and the data inside of it. Um, the asset has to be assigned a criticality uh, based on the uh, data that it's stored. So you have to assign a criticality to your assets. So servers that contain CUI would obviously be uh, higher in criticality than, let's say, workstations or something that uh, does not contain CUI. Uh, and those higher uh, those critical uh, assets must have uh, commiserate security controls over them. So things like making sure that they're encrypted, making sure that access is restricted, that they are within secure environments, they're not on a corporate environment, but they're on a production environment or some, an environment that is you know, protected by a firewall, DMZ, um, is monitored uh, by a SIM. You don't just want servers out on your corporate network or, or wherever where they are not being monitored and secured. And uh, as we discussed earlier, we also want to make sure that there is a formal onboarding process. So just like with your personnel, you want to make sure that you're onboarding your assets. And you're going to hear that uh, over and over as we go through these control families, because no matter what you're doing, if you're making a change to your organization, you're adding something to it and a user, a system, you want to make sure that there's a formal process for the documentation of the requesting, the approval and the actual onboarding of that asset, personnel, whatever it is. Uh, you want to make sure you're documenting approval, what's actually being done, what's requested, any security impacts that uh, may result in that. So let's say you want to move uh, on-prem um, assets to a cloud asset. All right, well, that's you have to determine what is the impact of it? Uh, what are the security impacts of that? And personnel that are accessing on-prem now have to go to, let's say, AWS or an Azure cloud. Are you able to enforce two-factor authentication on that? Um, are you able to restrict access uh, the same way you're doing on-prem? You want to make sure that all of that is documented and um, available to the uh, asset owner and approver so that they can make their decision as to whether or not to allow this asset to be onboarded to your system. 
And then finally, just like with users, you want to make sure assets that no longer uh, require uh, access to your systems be decommissioned. So that needs to be documented as well. You want to make sure that uh, assets are de uh, decommissioned when they uh, no longer need access and they are not, you're not allowing assets uh, access to your system after that date. Just like with users, that's where a lot of your um, a lot of vulnerabilities can can uh, turn up when you are just allowing access privileges be a user or a or an asset, and you're not maintaining that inventory. Eventually, you have access privileges. You have users that have admin privileges that don't need it. You have uh, devices that are uh, that no longer need access. Those assets are the ones that are going to eventually have the vulnerabilities that allow attackers to get in. So those, those are the first two control families. We'll continue to go through them uh, through our Unhacked series. I'm Brian Graff, and we will see you next Thursday here on Unhacked.